church in America uh, thought they were no more than a speck of dirt, you'd have revival overnight. Pride's what's killed the church in this country, folks. It's good to be here. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Colossians with me tonight, please. Colossians. This is one of the, um, uh, what they call the prison epistles. Colossians. And we'll go to chapter number one. <clears throat> Colossians chapter number one. And verse number 13. The scripture says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Bless this book now, Lord, in thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. What I just gave to you in reading in the book of Colossians is what's called Christology. Now, these are the words, names that they give to things in the Bible. For example, like homartiology, theology, soteriology, eschatology, and all theologies. Uh, they classify these things in the scriptures to having a departmental understanding of that text and find it throughout the New Testament. As it relates to this, Christology is the unique doctrine of Christ. Now, he's found in everything. Search the scriptures, and you, do you think you have eternal life? They are they that testify of me. You cannot separate Christ from the word of God. But Christology is the unique study of Christ, who he, who he is. Who is this one? And the, uh, uh, the book of Colossians is, Colossians is what's called a prison epistle. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are the four prison epistles. Now, what's a prison epistle? These are books that the Apostle Paul wrote while he was in Rome. And he wrote them while he was in bounds or while he was bound up, he said. Truth is, he was kept in his own private home and he was allowed visitors. But uh, that's it. He couldn't travel on his own. So he was uh, essentially uh, uh, kept in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, locked up. And this book of Colossians has a practical section to it. If you get on over here in chapters uh, number three, and you'll see that the apostle gets into the, is, into the issue of, of how you live your life. And uh, it's important because uh, how you live your life is going to have to do with uh, the rewards of the judgment seat of Christ and, uh, and everything that has to do with it. And chapters three and four of uh, the book of Colossians deals with that. But what I read to you tonight from the first chapter of Colossians is a direct reference to who Christ is. And as has been said by more than one, this is some of the highest theology you'll find in the New Testament. It's packed. These few verses that I just read to you tonight are packed. They're loaded as it relates to Christ. He's called the Savior. Look at verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. To save is to deliver, to make you free, to cause you to escape, to allow you to come out of the clutches of one, as if you might be locked up in a jail or something, uh, bound by the power of Satan. These, these, uh, these powers have been broken because that's what salvation is about. Salvation includes the removal of guilt and the penalty of sin. Guilt and conviction of sin are entirely two different things. Guilt is Satan beating you to death with your life and what you've done, even though you've been forgiven for it, to tear you down and to break your fellowship with God. Conviction of sin is the work of the Holy Spirit to bring you to God. 
is to bring you to Christ, to be forgiven. Also to be delivered from the authority of Satan. He's the God of this world. And at his will and behest, he causes people to do things. He moves them. He speaks to them. He binds them up. He fills them with his spirit. And they become his slaves. They're bound to him. But when you're born of the spirit of God, once you've been saved, you have been broken from that authority of Satan. He's no longer your God. He's not my God tonight. Amen. My God is the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says in verse number 13 also that he hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his son. To translate literally is to mean is to change positions, is to move from one place to the other. Uh, Methistami is the Greek word here and it's a aorist, passive uh, subjective. Now let me tell you what aorist means. I mentioned it to you the other day. I want to mention it to you again. Aorist has to do with past tense, but it's different from our past tense. When you get into the aorist part, you get into something that's past that'll never be repeated again. That's where you see the difference. Never be repeated again. So therefore, he has translated us. He has taken us out of the cage. He has freed us from the power of Satan and he cannot take it again. It's finished. Thanks be unto God. The Bible says in verse 14 that he redeemed us in whom we have redemption through his blood. Notice the fourfold relationship of Christ our salvation. He redeemed us. It is to release a prisoner by paying a ransom. Now, there's a lot of controversy about who got the ransom, who paid the ransom, so forth and so on. That's not the issue tonight, but it was paid. And when it was paid, it was paid by the blood of Christ and by his death on the cross. You cannot be saved by his life. You will not be saved by somebody saying he did something when he descended into the heart of the earth. That has nothing to do with your salvation. Everything that has to do with your salvation was accomplished at the cross. It's finished, he said, and you cannot add to that. And so therefore, he redeemed us. And notice in verse number 14, and this is so wonderful, even the forgiveness of sins. Redemption and forgiveness go hand in hand. If you've been redeemed, you've been forgiven. I'm glad I've been forgiven because I've got a lot of bones, amen. I've got a past. I lived I live like hell for 27 years. And thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. He forgave me for what I was and what I used to be, changed me and put his spirit in me and I am no longer what I was. Now don't you look at verses 15 through 17. This brings you not uh, past the savior, he's the savior, but now he's the creator. The scripture deals with him as the creator. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter number one, Bereshith bara Elohim hashamayim. Bara is the Hebrew word for create. What does that word mean? It means to bring into existence from nothing. In other words, by speaking his word. He did not have to fashion the universe. He simply spoke it. That's a God, folks. I want you to take that in tonight. That's God. That's power that is beyond our comprehension to simply speak it into existence. There is nothing that can do that except the Almighty. And that's what he's called in Revelation chapter number one. The Lord Jesus Christ in verse number eight is called the Almighty. And he is the Almighty, El Shaddai in Hebrew in the Old Testament. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator, verses 15 through 17, who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth. Now watch this, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. He's before him and by all things, by him all things consist. Now, you know, when you say an invisible entity or an invisible thing or something of that nature, uh, then so-called science uh, gets, has a problem with it. But I have no problem whatsoever. A spirit being in its essence is invisible. And the Bible says in John chapter number four, the woman at the well, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So therefore God is invisible. So who is Christ? He's God manifest in the flesh. That's where we get the word Emmanuel, 
God with us, manifest in the flesh. Why was he manifest in the flesh? He was manifest in the flesh so he could die at the cross, but it was manifest in the flesh so you could behold him. Amen. We don't have the ability to see in the invisible world unless they show us. Now, the Old Testament prophet had the ability to see what was there. God showed him what was there. Do you remember that story? Remember what Elisha said? Oh, Lord, open his eyes. And the hills were full of chariots. And the angels of God were there. Elisha knew they were there. So his relationship as creator is he existed before creation. Look at verse 15. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, this word firstborn throws a lot of people for a flip. They have a problem with it. They think, well, good night. It says creature. He's a creature. No, he's not a creature. Firstborn in this text has to do with his place, his status, not with, his, not with anything other than that. In plain words, he is ahead of all creation. That's what it means. That's how it, that's how it is understood in the text. And so therefore, he existed before creation, and by him all things were created. Now, it's the word all. Is that all-encompassing? Does that mean all? Were all things created that are in heaven, earth, so forth and so on? Of course it is. Well, then how could he, a creature, create? You see what I mean? And this, is, this of course, is what Arius did in the first century after Christ. Arius, where you get your, your get you, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, I, I mean to ask one sometime, are you still a Jehovah's Witness or are you a Yahweh Witness? Which one is it? I mean, have you, have you changed that? And they, you know, of course, the problem is they deny the eternal existence of the Son of God. That's their problem. They deny it. They deny it. They believe that Christ is a, he's God, but he's a created God. So he's a lesser God. He's below God. He's below Jehovah. Jehovah made him. And this, of course, is Gnosticism. It's classic Gnosticism. And that's all they are. They're Gnostics, modern day Gnostics. And they're not the only ones, but there's a lot of them with them. So the Bible says he existed before creation. And verse 16, it says, for by him were all things created. Now, look, you're looking at something in here tonight that answers a lot of questions. Where did this come from? How, how did it get here? Have you really, have you asked yourself that question, haven't you? I mean, you walk on this planet, you walk out here, you breathe its air, uh, you eat its food, we live on this thing, and we think to ourselves, where did that come from? I'm sure that uh, the PhDs at, uh, you know, anthropology and the rest of them, I'm sure they've asked themselves the question, where did it come from? If they haven't, they've got a problem, Right. If they've never asked themselves the question, where'd this come from? They don't, they don't, they have no right calling themselves a PhD. Right. Amen. Amen. Where did this come from? Well, here's where it came from. It came from the breath of God. Let there be. He spoke it into existence. I'll tell you something, folks, that, uh, that settles it with me. I got no problem with that. He's a creator. He's the creator and there's none beside him. Uh, in verse number 16, it says also, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. They exist because of him. Now, get on the Internet and do a little research in YouTube and find, ask the question, oh, what holds all this stuff together? And you get a thousand different answers. You'll get on there and you get into scientific world and they use big terms because they want to impress you. And they tell you, well, this holds it together. Well, this holds it together. This holds it together. This, uh, they don't have a clue. You know who holds it together? Amen. The Lord God does. Amen. That's who holds it together. He holds it all together. And it's quite a thing when you think about it, holding it together. Because the Bible says the day is going to come when he will no longer hold it together. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. And they'll literally pass away. The heavens will pass away. With a great noise. So he holds it all together. So therefore Christ is the creator. And he's the savior. I know him as the savior. But I know him as the creator. I have no problem with that. I believe there was a man upstairs. I believe there was a supreme being. And all that garbage before I got saved. But what's that? That's nothing. But once I met him. Now I know a person. And salvation is not a, a, it's not a theology. And it's not a, it's, you know, as I've said a thousand times. It's not a doctrine. It's not, uh, it's not agreeing with, uh, with, with some uh, uh, man-made system of belief. Salvation's a person. Amen. Either you have the Son of God or you don't. He that hath the Son, John said in 1 John 5, he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. How do you have him? You receive him, that's how. How do you receive him? You receive him. 
It's that simple. Well, I don't know how the Baptist, that's meaningless. Well, how do the Methodists, no, that doesn't mean a thing. Well, how do the Presbyterians receive him? That's nothing. How do you receive him? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. From your heart and from your soul, you reach out to him and ask, ask him into your soul. He'll come into your soul. You don't have to be a, 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 a theological major. I mean, how much theology did the thief on the cross have? <laughs> you know, what Bible college did he go to? And but he simply said, Lord, remember me. The simplest of terms, but it was a profound statement from the heart because that was his last hope. There was nothing left, nowhere to turn, nothing. Here I am. I've wasted my life. I've ruined it. I'm dying and I'm dying. I'm justly. He said, we receive our due rewards of our deeds. I'm dying justly. So he turned to the only hope he had and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's what he said. That's all he said. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You say, well, preacher, don't you need somebody to lead you to the Lord? The Holy Ghost will lead you. Now you, if it's okay for somebody to come and pray with you, open the Bible and talk to you and counsel with you, that's all good. Lord have mercy, yes, that's all, that's all wonderful. But folks, the one who really brings you to Christ is the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Holy Spirit. And he'll bring you to Christ. Now don't you notice something else here in chapter number one and verse number 18. Here's what it says. And he's the head of the body, the church. A church is the body of Christ. That's in a mystical sense, a spiritual sense. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The body of Christ. They're the Baptist writers. They're the body of Christ. Nobody else is. Roman Catholic Church. No, we are the apostolic church. Nobody else is. The Greek Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, all the Orthodox churches, Presbyterian, Methodist, the whole thing. You get into it and you'll find that there are literally thousands, tens of thousands. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I understand that. But there are tens of thousands of denominations in the Christian church. And I don't know if every one of them claims to be the it, <laughs> the only one. But that's a whole lot of people seeing it in a whole lot of different ways, don't you think? The Bible said, for by one spirit are you all baptized into the Baptist church, whether it be Jew or Greek, bond or free. Right? That's not what it says, is it? What's it say? For by one spirit are we all baptized into what? How many bodies? One body. You were placed into that body by the Holy Spirit. You mean the baptismal pool didn't do it? No, the baptismal pool is an ordinance and that's a good thing. That's a witness and a testimony. But what put you into Christ? The Holy Ghost did. For by one spirit are we all baptized. The Holy Spirit brings you to Christ and puts you into Christ. Amen. So the body of Christ is made up of every believer on this planet. Every born again believer. You're in the body of Christ at that moment. Now you may be in the wrong local assembly. And the truth of the matter is that if you're really born again, and you get on your knees and pray and ask God to lead you in the spirit, uh, if you're in the wrong place, he'll get you out of there. There'll, there'll, be, there'll be something about it where you realize, I don't, I, don't, I don't need to be here. I've talked to two or three people just in the last few days that said that essentially the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was saved, but I got very uncomfortable in that crowd, and they were uncomfortable with me. And uh, so I had to find somewhere else. I had to leave. And the reason he did is because he was born in the Spirit of God. And uh, this, is, this happens. You, folks, the Baptist church is, 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 as they say, a big tent. There's a lot of Baptists, a lot of different types of Baptists. But just because you're a Baptist doesn't mean that you're a Christian or that you're born again. And just because you're a Methodist doesn't mean you're going to hell either. Amen. You'll find God's people scattered all over the place. Amen. And thanks be unto God for that. Amen. That's important to me. Uh, but I want you to notice the most important statement of what I'll say to you tonight is found in verse 18. The Bible said he's the head of the body, the church. Now, you've heard the word of four, and I'll give it to you one more time tonight. The Greek word is ekklesia. That's what the Greek word is for church. And it means a called out assembly. It could be a bunch of drunks out in the street raising the devil, called out of the drunken uh, uh, bar, or it could be the church of God called out 
of the world of unbelievers forming his body. That's what the word means. In other words, the word in itself is not spiritual or holy. It's simply a Greek word that means called out. So it's translated church. So when we say church, we're saying the body of Christ is a called out assembly. Called forth from this world. Amen. Separate. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And he will meet with you. But look at verse 18. He's the head of the body of the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And of course, you understand that he's the first one to rise from the dead, never to die again, raised by the power of the Holy Ghost of God, declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. His resurrection was unique, none before, none after. There's only been one resurrection like the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible says in verse number 18, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, now look at this, this is what's important. This is what's important. He might have the preeminence. He's head of the head. He's above the highest one. The king has his rightful place. The queen has her rightful place. Uh, secular government has a, rightful, has a job to fulfill, a place to fulfill. Uh, right now, the kingdom of, uh, of heaven is in the hands, essentially, of the secular governments until the Lord Jesus comes back and takes back what is his. And the Bible said, honor the king, you know, obey the laws. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not uh, uh, insurrectionists tonight. Uh, we're, not, we're not here to, in sedition to overthrow the government. That's not what we're here for. We're here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and lift up his holy name and to be good citizens. That's what we do. That's what we're supposed to do. Obey the laws of the land. And, uh, and so, but notice what it says. He has the preeminence. Preeminence. Now, I want to give you four things tonight, five things. And this is what's important about our church and about your life and about everything that matters in this life. The preeminence of Christ. Number one, if the Lord Jesus Christ is preeminent in this church, there's going to be a battle of spirits. You better believe it. Yes, sir. You better believe it. Like I say, spirits are invisible beings and they can inhabit a physical body. But the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, Paul, I know, and uh, Jesus, I know, but who are you? You see, they know him. They said, we know who thou art, the Holy One of God. You know who said that? A demon said that. Yeah. So what does that mean, preacher? That means that if you have the Holy Spirit in you, if you're really a born-again believer, you're going to go into some churches and feel comfortable. People are going to be comfortable with you. It's going to be the kind of spirit that you want. Christ is exalted in that place. He's lifted up. But if, you're in a, if you are in a religious place where it's all about men and it's not about Christ, you're going to get in the midst of a spiritual struggle like you wouldn't believe. This is what will make us, will make us or break us. We'll live or die by this. This is where you take your stand. The Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely everything in here or he's nothing. As one said, he's Lord of all or not Lord at all. Somebody said, well, now, good night, preacher. You're preaching lordship salvation. No, I'm not. I'm preaching the grace of God. But if you call Jesus Lord, what does that mean? That means that he is Lord. He is Lord. So then, preacher, you mean if we have a service in here and you fail to... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, uh, plug the wrong people, <laughs> uh, <laughs> brag about the wrong ones. Uh, uh, it's it's going to hurt us. No, it'll help us <laughs> because the only one that really matters is Christ. The second thing is that when Christ is preeminent, it'll judge our purpose. What are we here for? The apostle said, I came to preach Christ and him crucified, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, you know, 46 years ago when I came to Temple, we had great men in the church. I use the term great men. I use the term great men. I use it. I, I use it. I hate, I'm not in a mocking way. I don't like to mock. But I, I don't know if you remember if I told you that when we came to Temple, I believe I did the other day. Uh, my wife and I came here in 1976, and all we heard was great men, great men, great men, great men, great men. This is a great man. That's a great man. This is a great man. I never heard of any of those great men. I didn't know any of them. I knew the Lord Jesus. I had met him three years before. 
Amen. And I had gotten along pretty good for three years without any of the great men. And all we heard was this great man, that great man. Have you, do you know this great man? Have you met this great man? Look at this great man over here and this great man. And my wife said to me, she's a very practical woman. She said, boy, <laughs> they got a great man problem there. <laughs> yeah. It's Christ in here, folks. It's not great men. It's not great men. If you really look at it, you think about the great men. What would we be without Christ? What would we be? What would you be? Where would you be if you didn't have the Lord Jesus? He's the only one that really matters, isn't he? Isn't, didn't Abraham say, I'm dust and ashes? Didn't he just sing about dust, dirt? You see, but here's the thing, see, the Lord Jesus can take dirt and turn you into a son of God. Amen. Amen. I didn't say thee, I said a. Hey, a son of God by the new birth. Yes, he can. So what do you say then, preacher? I say that we ought to come to this house and we ought to have Christ on our mind and we ought to think about him, pray to him, talk about him, love him, look to him for everything that is life, for he is life. Life is him. Life revolves around him. Life goes to him and from him. And he's the only one who really ultimately is worth giving your life for is the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing that, uh, that you'll find out in his preeminence is self versus Christ. Now, there's a lot of people that like to be recognized. They really do. They, if, when they do something, well, I'll tell you what, buddy. I mean, I put a lot of time into that, and he didn't say a word about it. Yeah. Well, you did, did you do it for me, or did you do it for the church, or did you do it for Christ? Amen. Amen. That's what matters. You did it for him. He'll let you know about it. I try to let people know that I appreciate what they do. I do. And I'm terrible sometimes. Forget who, who does this or that. And uh, I don't do it intentionally. Lord knows I don't. And uh, I'll, I'll get up here sometimes and I'll start thanking this person and that person and this person and that person. And then when the service is over with, my wife will say, now you missed so-and-so over there. <laughs> I'll say, I'm not going to do it again. Write the names down. <laughs> That way I don't miss anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But you see, here's the thing about it. It's not about me, is it? It's not about you. Who's it about? Let's just somebody come in this house tonight and they're loaded down with sin. They got problems. They're beat to death. They need help. You know, they're dying spiritually. Am I going to change their life? Christ is going to change their life. So my responsibility is to give them the Lord Jesus Christ. Give them his preeminence. Amen. You meet me, you know, we, you, you meet me, know me, and then leave and forget my name. You haven't lost anything. But you meet him and forget his name, you've lost everything. And then finally, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ is the church. He is the body of Christ. Yes, he is. Because he is. He's Christ. It's his body. And uh, it's his church. It's not mine. I don't own it. Uh, you know, I'm just here. I may be gone tomorrow. This may be the last time I ever stand up here behind this pulpit. Who knows? We're not guaranteed anything. As you, have you lived long enough yet to figure out that you may not be around the next day? How I many how I many really know that? Okay. I mean, really? <laughs> you never know. You don't know. I mean, down through the years, I've seen people that look big, strong, you know, look like they could uh, uh, pick up a log or anything, but just die. Just die. So that's the thing. And I think it's probably good for us. I wouldn't want God to tell me, now next Tuesday you're going to drop dead at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I was thinking, good enough. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that. I just would just soothe the Lord came around 3 o'clock next Tuesday afternoon and says, time to go, son. I'd rather have it that way, wouldn't you? Amen. Amen. Have that hanging over my head. You know, I guarantee you, you wouldn't do much sleep in between now and next Tuesday, would you? <laughs> No, he is to be exalted. This world's a wicked place. There's a lot of stuff out here that, that hurts. It hurts, folks. It really does. You see things happen to people that hurt you. You see the way they suffer, and it hurts you. It bothers you. You see injustices done. You know, why, why do people suffer? I heard a testimony today as a brother I listened to a lot on the radio and he said this, he said that 
I think his name was Eli Weissel. He was a Jew, and he was in one of the concentration camps. He was like, like uh, Belsen Belsen or Auschwitz or, or Treblinka, one of them in World War II. And he said he was standing underneath a young boy, a young boy. The boy, I think, was 16 years old. That boy was limp. He was dead. He had just been hung by his neck, and he died. All right, this is what he had suffered in this, in this, in this, in this, uh, you know, this camp by the Nazis. And here's what he said. Here's what he said. He said, when I looked up and saw that dead boy hanging there and I touched his dead body, he said, at that moment, my God died. And that's what he said. Now, why did he say that? Well, he said that because he lost all hope in him. That's why he said that. He said that because... If this boy is going to die and there's so much suffering and sorrow in this world, if there is a God, why does he let all this happen? That's the reasoning. You're going to find people, you talk to them, they're going to say that to you. They're going to say, well, if we serve a God of love and a God who cares about us, why all this suffering? Why, why do the good people suffer? Why is there so much pain and sorrow in this world? Well, scripturally, we know why. The Bible said in the book of Romans, chapter number eight, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The curse of sin is coming down upon us. But here's the point I want to make tonight. This is what's important. The Bible said, of him, through him, and to him are all things. Now think on that for a moment. Everything must come to him. Everything must go through him. Everything is from him. In plain words, no essence or element of life can exist but by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the life you live in this world, if you have no answer, he's the answer. If there is no light, he's the light. If you have no joy, if you have no victory, focus upon him. He may not tell you the answer you're looking for. That may not happen. But he is the answer. Yeah. The Bible talks about in the book of Acts, the restoration of all things. Don't get off into a bunch of stuff in here tonight with you, but I'll tell you this. The Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely and completely not only the creator of everything that exists, he upholds everything that exists. And everything that exists has one type of relationship with him, one way or another. That includes the devil. That includes hell. That includes heaven. That includes everything. So if you can't make it, if you can't get through another day, if it starts bearing down on your soul, take hold of that nail-scarred hand or reach up and get a hold of that foot and you're taking hold of the wisdom of God. That's what he's called. Christ is the wisdom of God and he will be able to do for you what nothing else can do. He may not answer your questions, but just his presence by faith taking hold of him, that'll give you the strength you need to get through it. Bless his righteous name. Bless your name, Holy One. In the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Lord, I say tonight, as John the Baptist said, I mean it with all of my soul. I must decrease, but you must increase. Amen. I must decrease, but you must increase. If in this house tonight, do you remember what this brother said to us Sunday? Talking about Adrian Rogers. That was one of the finest illustrations I've ever heard. You know, he prayed for God to anoint him, to give him his spirit and give him power. No answer. Got down on his knees, prayed again. No answer. Then he got down on his face and buried his nose in the dirt. And the Holy Ghost began to roll upon his soul. And he felt that power come into his being. Oh, what a wonderful thing that is. I hope, you've, I hope you've had that. If you've never had it, I pray you will. But you see what he did? He got to the place to where God could bless him. That's what we've got to do tonight. 
If you in your heart and in your soul can say, Lord, I agree with John the Baptist. I must decrease. My wisdom must decrease. My experiences must decrease. My ability must decrease. And you must increase. You are everything there was, everything there is, and everything there ever will be is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now bow your head for a moment tonight. And let's see if you can say it with me. <coughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, but from your heart, can you say, Lord Jesus, I must decrease and you must increase. You must increase until you fill my life with your presence, until my mind is fixed upon you, until I sing your songs and praise you with everything that's in me. I must decrease, Lord. I must decrease and you must increase. Can you pray that with me? Lord Jesus, I must decrease and you must increase. In your holy name I pray. Amen, amen. Now take it to heart. Take it to heart. Take it with you. And think about it. Tonight and tomorrow and this coming week. Focus your attention on the Lord Jesus. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Well, that first application and fulfillment of that, obviously, is the cross. But I think it also has to do with the preaching of Christ. Amen. Well, God bless you for listening to me, folks. Amen.